Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday service. It is nice to see you all and to be sharing this time together. Thank you for taking time out of this beautiful summer day to come and share in truth and in wisdom and in understanding. I'm going to start today's talk <clears throat> with a reading from Whispers from Eternity, Yogananda's book of prayer demands and poems. And this is number 199, Endless Thrills of Delight. I attuned my life with thine. Now my life has become a long, unbroken inspiration. Thy fountain of bliss refreshes and delights me night and day, whether I be wakeful, fast asleep, or dreaming fondly of thee. Oh, what has become of me? Delight on overwhelming delight, endless, indescribable thrills of divine delight spray unceasingly over me. O oh, aged nectar, wine of centuries, I found thee at last and will taste of thy sweetness forever, forever, forever. Thank you. I remember the uh, first time <clears throat> I went to Sunday service, or it was one of the first few times I went to Sunday service at Ananda Village. Uh, it was, at that point, the only Ananda. It was mm, about 29 years ago or so. And afterwards, uh, it was, we were a young family and, you know, kind of bright and shiny and looked, must have looked full of promise. Uh, we certainly were aspiring. And uh, afterwards, a woman came up to me and she said, there's a pool party over at the Crystal Hermitage, over at Swami Kriyananda's place. And it's for the community members. And why don't you come? Why doesn't your family come and join us? And I said, really? And she said, oh, yes, you should come. And about that time, Swami Kriyananda walked up. And she turned and very gracefully said, Swamiji, this is, and introduced us and introduced us. And she said, I have, I have invited them to the pool party over at the Hermitage. And Swamiji looked at us and he said, I'm so sorry. This was intended for members of the community. And my energy just went straight to my toe chakras. <laughs> and I just felt this, this wave of disappointment and exclusion. But I swallowed and I looked up and I said, I can completely understand. It's OK. And he said, well, in that case, you should come. <laughs> Do we have some music? <laughs> <laughs> Attunement is the key to the spiritual path. Attunement is everything on the spiritual path. Attunement, you know, there are, we use this example, but it's such a vivid example. Every year, you know, art schools churn out hundreds or thousands of graduates in art. And they all use the same essential paints, and they all use the same essential canvas, and the same essential um, oils or uh, acrylics or whatever medium they're using. But how many masters are there of art? How many pieces hang in galleries for centuries, inspiring the lives of mankind to reach beyond the mundane and into the skies of inspiration and possibility? It's few, why? What's the difference? How many of us go to school to learn more and become more? And how many of us come from those experiences really knowing anything more? I went to college many years ago. Um, it was a bizarre thought. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to share it, but I suppose I will. Um, I decided to go to college to be a doctor because I figured a friend of mine was going to college. Um, she was female. <laughs> and I couldn't, I, I had no plans to go to college. I had no idea what to do with my life. But she was going, and she was going to go be a, a vet. And I thought, oh, well, that sounds good. I guess if she's going, maybe I'll just go to college. I've got nothing better to do. But if I'm going to go to college, maybe I'll just do something that I couldn't do if I didn't go to college. 
So I figured I could do anything. So I figured I'd be a doctor. I'd follow in my father's footsteps. And I got there, and it was worse than I ever imagined. I went to I. <laughs> it was. I went to Iowa State. OK, young people, close your ears. Um, I went to Iowa State University, very good college, about 20, 25,000 students. And I studied the natural sciences, and um, I was good at it. It was very natural. I, I, loved, I loved the sense of becoming more intimate with how life really worked. There was a, I don't remember who said it, but it was a, a naturist, you know, a couple of centuries ago. He said, walking through a natural history museum uh, without knowing natural history, or walking through nature without knowing natural history, is like walking through a museum with all the paintings turned to the wall. And it's true. You know, unless we have awakened a relationship with the world around us, we just, we're always separate from it. We're always kind of looking at it and as, as a stranger, as a foreigner. And so I, I felt the power of increased intimacy and understanding through the bio, biological sciences, through chemistry, through physics. But I also realized that it was intellectual. And I looked around me, and the purpose of school wasn't knowledge and understanding. It was to crank out socially viable individuals who could go get a job and perform some function. And I thought, it's a little bit, it's, it's kind of not it. And people were so excited about making money and so excited about getting a good job. And I, I kind of already knew that the pot was poisoned, I already knew that the game was rigged and that, that joy and happiness and fulfillment came from something far beyond that. And I increasingly found myself <coughs> a fish out of water. I knew that life held possibilities far beyond simple intellectual or social pursuits. And I saw people graduating every year and going on into these lives radiant with possibility. And, and you know, I've, I've kept in touch with enough people and watched enough um, to see what happens across time when that's the summum bonum, that's the, the pinnacle of aspiration is, is this life. It, it withers and fades. The body does what the body does. The mind does what the mind does. Relationships do what they do. You know, the kids you thought were going to make you happy often end up, um, you know, working at cross purposes. We'll say kindly. Um, the job you thought was going to, to fulfill you often just consumes your time and leaves you in, a, in, in an embattled environment. And I, I looked to, to see. I, I would look to see, where can I find something more? And I would see somebody who had wholeness. And so this became kind of a, a life pattern for a number of years. I'd see somebody who had wholeness and just was radiant with joy and strength and you know, the confidence of integration. And I'd go, they got it. And I would follow them. I would tune into them. I would try and figure out what they had. But in every single case, what I saw was in a very small environment, in a very narrow enclosure, they had that capacity. I was out for a drive. I'm, I'm, this could have been anybody it happened to be my father, who was one of the most confident and broadly confident men and people I had ever met. He was a psychiatrist. He was very accomplished in his field. He was um, wise. He was um, stable through almost everything. But he'd just gotten a new car, and we were out driving. And uh, we were out in the, in the country in Kansas. And you know, it is unmarked territory way out there. And we pulled up to a stop sign in the middle of literally nowhere, and the car stopped. It wasn't intended to, I mean, the car stopped, but the engine stopped. <laughs> and, and I looked over at him, because I thought, well, what's this? And he just kind of had this look of bafflement and concern. Because he looked around also, and he could see, you know, there was you know, large tracts of land, large tracts of land with houses you know, scattered far and wide. And there was nothing on the horizon that we could see. Um, and he got out, and he opened the hood, and he looked in. 
I just remember this day so vividly. He looked in, and he looked back at me, and he looked back in at the car, and he twiddled something, and he fussed with something else. He came back, and he tried to start it, and nothing. And this went on for a few minutes, and he came back over, and he kicked the tire. <laughs> and you could see this mounting concern and frustration and fear and anxiety and tension. And I went, that's not it. That's not it. The capacity to be in tune with life under any circumstance, I knew that was what was worth seeking. And whenever I saw a crack in the egg, whenever I saw a place where it no longer stood up, I knew I needed to keep looking. And it happened time after time after time. Um, I, I stopped attempting to be a doctor. I realized that being a doctor was not quite enough. And I didn't know what was. And it wasn't until I found the autobiography of a yogi. It, it was many years later, it was 1982, that somebody handed it to me. And I read it, and it was a weird read. Most of, who, has, who has not read the autobiography of a yogi? Anybody in here? Uh, if you haven't read it, read it. It's one of the great adventures. I warn you, on page eight, he has people appearing and disappearing out of a field. Um, there's going to be many things in the book that probably don't add up. I don't know about you. Maybe you've seen people appearing and disappearing in fields. If you have, you'll feel right at home in even that part of the book. But I knew the second I opened it, and I don't know how, but I knew the second I opened it that he had what I had always been looking for. And then I read it through, and there were many things I had to just kind of put up on the shelf and leave there because I couldn't reconcile them with my experience. But never once in the writing of that book, in the reading of that book, did I ever feel that there was not the capacity to hold wholeness, joy, a relationship to the center of life under every condition. And it wasn't that there weren't lots of conditions. He wrote of life. He wrote of death. He wrote of testing. He wrote of school. He wrote of everything. He, I, I felt very... Um, vindicated when I realized that he also was not an academic and resisted the school experience. Uh, fortunately, nobody, I didn't have a guru look at me and say, you have to go back and finish. Um, but uh, he wrote of the process that allows each one of us to rediscover that wholeness under every condition of life that brings us into increasing relationship with every aspect of life, with other people, with other creatures, with the ups and downs and vagaries of what happens in the moments. And I thought, That's, that is what I want. That is what I want. And he, he talked, he wrote about, he said four things. He said, yoga is, yoga is the body of science from ancient times that gives us the capacity to relate to the source of life appropriately and to relate, therefore, to life appropriately throughout all those vagaries. And he said, yoga developed to give everybody at every stage of life a way to turn back toward the center. So yoga is a vast field, and you can do yoga to get rich. You can get, do yoga to get revenge. You can do yoga to look pretty. You can do yoga to be younger. You can do yoga for many, many different aspirations, and not all of them laudable. But yoga, because everything comes from God. Isn't that interesting? Everything comes from God. The nifty things, the not-so-nifty things. All of it equally comes from the same source. And if, you, if yoga has, has something for everybody, because even if your aspirations, Swami talked about this, and I've puzzled it for years, even if your aspirations are not laudable, if you turn toward yoga, if you turn toward God to solve the problem, at least you have a connection with the spirit. At least you're turning in the right direction. And that can carry you to, over time into increasing understanding, into increasing refinement of what goals are worth having and how to, how to achieve fulfillment in life. But Yogananda said there are four things that are central. If what you really want is you really want wholeness, 
You don't just want to look prettier. It will fade anyway. Nothing lasts. Even the greatest powers don't last. There is no fountain of youth outwardly. But if you want, if you want fulfillment of the, of the very things that you seek, the joy, eternal joy, love that's overwhelming and embraces everything, if you want the completeness of your life, he said four things. He said, these work on you at the very core of the need and the very core of what's happening. And it's Hong Sa, the power of concentration. Energization, the power to control life force and to have at your at access to all the energy you will ever need whenever you need it and to use it appropriately. He said, the power of communion, the Om technique, the ability to go inside and fill with the power of Om, the sound of Om. We chanted that, but that's a real thing. It's inner communion. And the Bible refers to it. Every great scripture refers to the inner sounds and the inner lights. And then the power of Kriya Yoga. The power of Kriya Yoga to go in and release inside all the things that keep us frozen and stuck. Because really, the, the, limiting, the limiting thing on the path, the limiting thing in life is how full of ourselves we are instead of full of spirit. Right? When we're full of, <laughs> if you're full of yourself, there's no room to be full of spirit. If you can empty that out, if you can get rid of those commitments to smaller things, then a larger realization and experience can fill you. So Kriya Yoga. And he said those things added combined with devotion. And he didn't say this, but it's, it's in there. Regularity, constancy, and the willingness to continue being in the, those practices will set you free. He said you could, you could become God realized in this life. There's nothing held back from you using these tools. And he didn't say if you're young and attractive. He didn't say if you're you know, mentally quick or, or he, there was no limitation. He said, this is for everybody. So go look in the mirror. You know, somebody once, you know the story of the little girl in Sunday school who's drawing feverishly and the teacher says, what are you drawing, honey? And she says, oh, I'm drawing a picture of God. And she says, nobody knows what God looks like. And she says, oh, they will in a minute. You know. What does God look like? Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Because God would express purely through you, and through you, and through me, and through you, and through you. In every circum, there's a beautiful story of the Bible. It's about Miriam. And Miriam is a beautiful young woman who becomes paralyzed. And she was a singer before she became paralyzed. But she's, she's very depressed because her life is meaningless. She's young, she's, you know, and she's, her whole life now is going to be one of increasing debility until she wastes away and just passes. And Jesus comes through her town, and he spends a few minutes with her, and then goes on. He doesn't, he doesn't fix her affliction. He doesn't bless her and have her stand up and go waltzing off. He touched her at the heart. He touched her with the knowledge of who she truly is, which is something eternal and beautiful and free of all limitation of form and time. And she begins to sing. And she fills the city. She's, she's carried out on a litter, and she sings for the town every day from that point on. And the melodies are so full of light that people come from all over. He could have cured her. He could have given her body back. But he didn't, because there's something so much more powerful most of us, not all of us, Nate, but most of us are old enough that we've seen the body do things that we would prefer it didn't do. Right? And if we, if we look down the train tracks, we can see it's probably going to continue in increasing manner <laughs> over time. And there's nobody who's exempt from that. There's nobody who's exempt from that. But the masters say, Get in touch with God. Get in touch with spirit from inside. And then all of this is just a dream. And in fact, there's a power that increases across time if you know how to live. Yogananda said, for those who do not know how to live, this world is a terrible machine that will tear them limb from limb. But for those who know how to live, this place is filled with magic and joy and power. <clears throat> and he talks about the fact that in the first phase of life, when you're donning powers, you, you, 
you learn and you grow and the ego grows strong and your sense of yourself grows very strong. And then you stand in a proper relationship. You learn how to stand in a proper relationship with life. And you stand there and you, you serve your family. You become a householder and the, the knowledge you gained, you exercise. You exercise it in the tests and trials of daily life, in business, in medicine, in architecture, in, in carpentry, in cleaning, in doing whatever it is that's yours to do. And the, res and the results of that exchange of energy you use to feed your family and care for those around you. And then your family grows up. And at that time, you've gone through the peak of your external powers. And either the game is broken, either, the, the, either this thing is broken, and God is a terrible jokester. Or our culture has missed it because our culture is based around that second cycle. And everybody values themselves in relationship to that second cycle. But if you've done your work right and you've used your first two ashrams of life powerfully, you discover that as your kids leave, you can simplify your life. And life Yogananda talks, a simple life is a free life. There's so much more experience that comes from being free. So as the kids drift and as, the, as the, the house gets smaller and you let go of things, an increasing sense of freedom and wholeness grows. And then you're able to serve and help guide the people who are in the first and second ashrams of life. And your life becomes one of just, just increasing freedom and increasing self-offering and increasing joy and lightness of spirit. And as the body begins to function less, you need it less. It's actually designed perfectly. You don't need the body to do the same things because you're not going to use the body the same way. You've used it. You've exercised it. And gradually as it goes through its process, and you go through the process of helping others as they're growing and fulfilling their dharma, the body starts to really dysfunction. But if you really use that third ashram right, as the body starts to let go, you are so ready to let it go. You're so ready to kick the frame and just merge into the infinite spirit and let go of all the limitation of this world and all the limitation of, of its gladnesses and sadnesses and, and happiness and pain. And, and you're just, just done. You're just done. And it's very easy. The fourth ashram is just the process of increasingly moving into the presence of spirit is the only thing. But we can't get these things from just the external rules of life. And we can't get the experience of this without attunement and without receptivity and without guidance from those who have gone before us. And without a willingness to listen and entertain the possibility that something like this might be true. As long as we're full of ourselves and full of our assertion of how life is supposed to work and what we're supposed to be able to do, we'll never have anything except a very limited little box and will always be. I got a call last night from a dear friend who is a Kriyabhan. Yogananda said, when I lose touch with God, when I can't feel his presence, I do a few Kriyas and he's right there. I do a few Kriyas and he's right there. The practices are the things that give us the power to experience God and feel the attunement. Devotion and Kriya Yoga, devotion and meditation, receptivity. Lest we do those things, she called last night, and she's just in despair. Her life, the fates have taken an unfriendly interest in her life. Anybody ever have that happen? I can understand why, was it the Greeks or the Romans? They, they considered the fates to be goddesses of whimsy. And when the fates take an unfriendly interest, your life just seems to go from hell to hell to hell. You know, from one nasty thing to the next and the next and the next, and you just, you can't ever see it. Just, it's like they taunt you and they pass you to the next one. <laughs> and that's what she's going through. And we just talked for a little bit because she's isolated. She lives someplace where there's no other devotees. And we just talked. And I said, you know these things. And she says, oh, I know this stuff. I can't feel it. But we just hung out together for about a half an hour, 45 minutes on the phone, and just chatted of this and that and remembered God. Mentally, I was doing some Kriyas for her. And by the time it was over, she was back in the zone. She was just back there. Attunement. She was, re she was receptive. She was willing to attune to that vibration again. We can do that for each other. We need to do that for each other. We need to hold receptivity. This world is desperate for something else. And even our own lives, even as Kriya bonds, even as those 
some of the most fortunate people on the planet, it's hard to remember in a world that is trying to drag our consciousness and awareness into other thoughts of what's true. It's hard enough. We need to practice. We need to come together regularly, weekly. We need to come to service. We need to come gather together, build our resources, build community, enter community, share with each other so that we, as we go out into the world, we can hold it so that the world can draw on that and get in tune with something else as a possibility. It's what these masters have brought. It's what our lives are about. It's what this topic this week is about. You know, as long as we're full of ourselves, you know, when Swami thought I was just taking advantage of the goodwill of the community, he wasn't interested in my participation. But the second I was receptive and I tried to listen to the message of spirit, the message of respect, consideration, kindness, of course we belong. Because then we become channels for goodness into this world. Let's listen for the divine call. But then let's respond. Let's give our lives into this so that the song of our life is one filled with light and beauty and joy. And it radiates out into this world that's so desperate and fills the lives of others who don't know where to look. Let's take a moment of silence and we'll have some music. <laughs> 